I was sitting in there praying and just thinking, man, I can't believe I get to be a part of this every week. This is so awesome. I just feel so honored. You guys lead us in worship so well. Thanks, guys. That's awesome. Well, if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and flip open to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. And we're going to start with verse 13. Uh, today we start a brand new series uh, called Risky Church. And uh, I don't know about you, how many risk takers do we have in the house today? All right. Yes. Wow. That's right. All the risk takers are here in the second service. Fantastic. That's right. You were out taking risks this morning. Didn't come to the first service. You're here for the second service. You were out skydiving pre-service. It's fantastic. You know, um, I, I'm not a huge risk taker per se. I mean, probably the biggest risk that Katie and I ever took, we were on a missions trip and uh, we ended up going cliff diving one, one time. And, and we, it wasn't really that big a risk because you actually could not hit yourself on the rocks. If you jumped at all, even if you just fell off the side, you were falling in the ocean. Uh, but it was about 30 feet high and, or was it 35 or 40? I don't know. It, it grows by like, it grows by like five feet every year that I tell it. So anyway, but you know, that, that was a risky thing for us. It, you know, if you had to describe yourself in five words or less, would risky make the top five? I, I, I want you to think about the church as a whole. Now, I mean, you are the church, right? And so when you're describing yourself, you're describing God's church. And so I want you to think, if you had to describe the church, as you look across America, as you look across the world, would you say risky would be in the top five descriptors of who you are? If you look back at the early church, I think it was the number one descriptor of who they were. They were not safe at all. They really cared very little about safety. Their life was all about risk. It was all about taking the risk that Jesus had entrusted to them and risking it all so the world could know. And so as, as we looked, uh, we just finished up the book of John together. And we were praying about where to take uh, the church next. And the Lord's really laid this series on our heart. It's Risky Church. And for us, we really believe that the Lord is calling us to get back to some of the risks that the early church took. They, they took the world by storm. You think about just a few people. They really turned the world upside down. But it, it was because they were willing to risk everything for the kingdom of God. And so what would happen if this group of people, and people all over Mooresville, and, and people all over North Carolina, and the U.S., and around the world, what would happen if we were willing to risk everything like those disciples were? I mean, think about the, the, the statistics say that there's around a billion people who call themselves Christians. Uh, there's only seven billion people on the planet. And you, you think about what would happen if we just became risky people like the early church was risky people. Uh, and so over the next seven weeks or so, we're going to do something different than what we've done before. We're going to look at some topical things about some ways that the early church took risks and the way that God is calling us to take risks. And then we're going to do something together that week. All right. So we're going to have like a week where we do a risky fasting and prayer. So we're actually going to do a church-wide fast and we're going to have a celebration. We're going to do it on a Wednesday night. We'll have a celebration here on a Wednesday. That's going to be kind of cool. We're going to have uh, some risky generosity happening. We're going to have an Operation Blessing where we really bless the community and the world. Uh, and so I can't wait to tell you more about that. We're going to have some risky conversations with neighbors and with coworkers and friends. We're, we're going to have some risky relationships that start to happen and hold each other accountable. And we're going to look at God's word in a risky way too. So I'm, I'm really excited about this series. Each week we're going to have a little corporate challenge as we go along. And so, but before we do that, we really have to have this mindset about being risk takers for the kingdom of God. We really got to get back to the early church mindset. And so Let's look at what the Lord told Peter. Last week we talked about Peter's restoration, do you remember? And um, we finished up the book of John. We looked at how Jesus restored him after he had failed. And this week we're going to look back at Peter's first success, all right? We're, we're kind of coming full circle back to the beginning. And, and then uh, all throughout this series we're going to look through the book of Acts. We're going to look at some Old Testament stuff. Uh, we're going to move all over as we examine what it means to be a risky church. Because safety is overrated, all right? So let's look together. Matthew chapter 16, we're going to start with verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples... Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
Here's this great moment, right? Jesus is traveling with his disciples. He's starting to make a name for himself. He's healed people. He's rescued people. He's, he's spoken these amazing messages to people. And so he says, what are people saying about me? Who do they say I am? What's, what's my identity? Who do people say that I am? And they tell him and he says, all right, well, who do you say that I am? That's Honestly, that's probably the most important question you could ever ask yourself. Who do you say that Jesus is? And so Peter, he has this moment. He's the first of the disciples to open up his mouth. And this time he doesn't insert his foot like he normally does. He actually says the right thing. He comes out. He says, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. You're the Messiah. You're the one we've been waiting on. You're the Savior of the world. He has this awesome moment of success. Look what Jesus says to him. Uh... And Jesus answered, verse 17, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but my Father who's in heaven. He says, Peter, you didn't come up with this on your own. I mean, this is your moment of great success, but you didn't think of this. The Father put it in your heart to even be able to understand. You couldn't understand this on your own. Look what he says, verse 18. I tell you, you are Peter. He changes his name. He says, you are Petros. It's Rocky. Do you like the Rocky movies? Three people do. Fantastic. Uh, he says, you're rocky. You're a little rock. You're a little rocky. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do great things for you. I'm changing your name from Simon. Now you're going to be like my little rock. Like you're going to be in there. You're going to be my fighter, right? Look at what he says. Jesus points back to himself. He says, you're Peter, Petros. And on this rock, Petra, it's like a big rock, like a Grand Canyon size rock. He says, you're little rocky. I'm the big rock. On this rock, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell won't be able to prevail against it. He says, Peter, you're not the only one who's going to make this claim. You're not the only one who's going to believe. There's going to be millions of people. There's going to be billions of people who really say what you just said. You're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. You're my savior. You're my Lord. There's going to be millions and billions of people that think that same way, Peter. And I'm going to build my church, my followers... On me, I'm going to build the church. On me, the rock. And he says, when that happens, the gates of hell won't be able to prevail. Now, I don't know if you've read this. When I was a little kid growing up, I read this passage. I thought what that meant was, we're like nice little Christians in a nice little box in a nice little town. Almost like we're walled off, right? And the gates of hell are like coming at us. Oh, watch out, the gates of hell are coming for us, right? You know, and, and, and then they weren't going to be able to break through our barriers of defense that Jesus has up around us. And we're like, yay, they didn't prevail, right? That's not at all what this means. You know, gates are not really offensive objects. They're really defensive objects, aren't they? They're to wall people out, keep people out of your property. And Jesus looks at Peter and he says, listen, you've made this statement. I'm the Christ. I'm the son of the living God. You're right. I'm going to build millions of people that think that same way. And here's what's going to happen. When I change their heart, the gates of hell will not be able to keep them from storming in and taking enemy territory. Right now, Satan is in charge of all of this stuff. Oh, he's blinded all of these people. There's darkness all over. And Jesus says, when that happens, when I build my church, the gates of hell will not be able to withstand stand the earthquake of on fire believers that are going to storm through and take this enemy darkness and transform it into kingdom light. They're going to share the gospel and people's eyes are going to be open. The gates of hell won't be able to withstand their enemy force. He says, it's not going to be happening. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that description, safety is not the thing that first comes to my mind. Is it for you? What about comfort? Ease, right? Those are like the top three statements or words that really describe what Jesus is talking about here, is it? Look at what he says. He said, this isn't going to be automatic. This isn't just going to happen. He tells Peter, verse 19, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's a whole other sermon for another day. And then he says, then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one he was the Christ. It wasn't time. He wasn't going to the cross yet. He had not been crucified for the sins of the world. It wasn't time to share it. Look what he says, verse 21. It, it's not automatic. He says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. So he says, it's not going to happen automatically, Peter. I'm not just going to be like church and then boom all these people raise up and believe in me like you just said I've got to go and I've got to die 
for the sins of all these people so they can know me, Peter. And look at what Peter says to him. I love this. Peter took him aside. And he began to rebuke him. Saying, far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. I love it. He still calls him Lord, right? You're still leader. And you're still in charge, but you're crazy. I mean, uh, he goes to Jesus. And Jesus is the son of... You're the son of God. You're the Messiah. You're the one who knows everything. But Jesus, you're wrong about this. I mean, let's talk about this. I mean, let me correct your theology, Jesus. Because, you know, the Messiah, the Christ... He's the one that's going to come. He's going to set up an earthly kingdom. He's going to rule over everybody. That's what we've been taught, Jesus. So, I mean, you're, oh, have you been in the sun a little too long, Jesus? Do you need some water, Jesus? I can go and find a Samaritan woman to go and bring you some. I don't know. Whatever you need, Jesus, like, I, I, I'm here for you, but you're wrong. And look at what Jesus says back to Peter. I love this. He turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. That's awesome when... Jesus himself calls you Satan. He, he looked, Peter, Peter's like looking around like, Satan where? He's like, you, 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 you're Satan right now. You're, you're like hindering me. Look what he says. You're a hindrance to me. That word hindrance it means stumbling block. You're a stumbling block, Peter. Why was he a stumbling block? For you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but the things of man. Jesus says, I'm going to risk everything, Peter. I'm going to risk my life for this new church that I'm going to build. No, Jesus, you can't do that. Your life should be a life of comfort and safety and ease. And he says, no, that's man's thinking. That has nothing to do with the way I think. Look what he says, verse 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, if you really want to be part of my church, if you really want to be my followers, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. This is really huge for Jesus to say. I mean, a cross was the method of death. Jesus looks at them and he says, Listen, if you're after a life of comfort and a life of ease and it's all about safety, this thing called being my church is not for you. And he says, if you want to follow after me, you really want to be my church, the one that the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against you. You really want to be that kind of church, then safety is overrated. Listen, it's not about that. You're going to have to deny yourself. It's not about your comfort and your ease and your safety. And so you've got to just lay it all out on the line. You've got to deny yourself and pick up your instrument of death. You've got to be willing to suffer even to the point of death. And then follow me, then, then you'll be my church. Because that's what I did. Look what he says. For whoever would save his life will lose it. In, in your Bible, it's okay to write in your Bible. I promise Jesus won't get mad at you. In, in your Bible, over that little part, whoever would save his life will lose it. Put safety. Put safety right over the top of it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Put risk. Over the top of that second part. Do you see what he's saying? He says, if you want to make life about your comfort and your pleasure and your safety, and it's all about you, and you want to fit in this nice little box, and you want to be in charge, and you want to be in control, then he says, that's not the gospel. That's not what salvation is. That's you being God. Not me being God. If you try to save your own life, and you're going to model it, you're going to do what you want to do, and it's about your priorities, and your thoughts, and your dreams, and your visions, and your life, and... And you're really Lord. He says, you, you go after a life like that, then you're going to lose everything. You think you're keeping your life safe. But it's really the riskiest place to be. But he says, but on the other hand, if you're willing to give up everything for me, then you're going to find it. You're going to find true life. If, if you really look at me and say, you're Lord over everything. You're Lord over my time, over my finances, over my health, over my wealth, over everything, over every relationship. You really are Lord. I surrender everything to you. I give you my whole life. He says the person who lives like that, you're, you're modeling Jesus. You're, you're, you have life. You have life. You're going to find it. He says, you know what? Um, that's the place of true security is when you risk it all for him. Look what he says, verse... 25, <clears throat> for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he forfeits his soul? What shall a man give in return for his soul? Who cares if you have a safe life if you've been the master of it? But look what he says. 
For the Son of Man is coming to His angels, with His angels in the glory of His Father, and He'll repay each person according to what He's done. If you've made Him Lord, you're going to be rewarded for that. If you've risked everything and you've surrendered your life to Him, that is the place of true security because He's coming and you're going to get paid back. Do you see it? He says, if you try to make your life safe and you're in control and it's all about you and all this stuff, then He's not really Lord and you're going to lose it all. You're not really safe. But if you risk everything and say, it's all yours, God, that's the place of real security. Because He says, you've surrendered your life to me. That's not going to be forgotten. You've made me your Lord. I have eternity waiting for you. You see it? He says, that's the place of True, true security. Listen, um, the picture that Jesus wanted his followers to have, it wasn't all about them, about their comfort and their ideas and their ease and their safety. It was about having this place of risk for security. Write this down. I just have one point for you today. and I want you to think about this. This is so important for the rest of the series. If you don't get this today, the rest of this stuff totally won't make any difference in your life later. The rest of this series. Here, here's what I want you to understand. Never confuse... God's promise of security and peace with the myth of safety and ease. As believers today, there's this almost this, this lie that's spread around and it's like, you know, if you love Jesus, your life is going to be safe and you're not going to get sick and you're going to have a better life. And a, you add Jesus like this little stick on air freshener in your life and it's going to be better and your life's going to be better and your marriage is going to be better and, and your kids are going to be better. And, and you know what? You're not going to get sick and you're going to have a bigger, better house and a bigger, better life and all that. And Jesus says, that's not the gospel. That didn't work that way for me. Uh... I went to the cross. I gave everything. It didn't work that way for my followers. It wasn't like that for them. It wasn't this life believing in me. And they have this safety and comfort. And it's going to be this life of ease. He says, that's not the true gospel. He says, here's what is the real gospel. Risk everything you have because I'm worth it. Because I risked everything for you. I gave my life. In your place, I substituted my death for your death. I took your sin and paid for your sin, and I exchanged my righteousness for you. I'm worth the risk. So risk everything in this life because I've got eternity waiting for you. And even if something bad happens to you here, that's okay because you're secure. You can have peace no matter what. Listen, don't confuse God's promise that you can be secure and have peace for thinking you're always going to be safe. Nothing bad's ever going to happen. You're going to have a life of ease. That's not what the gospel says. I was looking through uh, a history of um, the first believers. I wanted to see if their life matched up with any of this risk-taking stuff. And so I looked up how did they all live? What happened after the resurrection? You know, Jesus said, go out into all the world, preach... Make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And lo, I'll be with you even to the end of the age, right? And so he says, listen, even if you're risking it all, I'll be there. I'll be with you. I'm not promising safety, but I'm promising security. I'll always be with you. I'll always make sure that you have this home in heaven with me. You can have peace regardless of any of the hard life circumstances that you're facing. And so I wanted to see what happened to them. So I, I've got just a list of some of the first few. You ready? Here's what they risked for the kingdom of God. Matthew, he suffered martyrdom in Ethiopia. And he was killed with a sword. Mark wrote the book of Mark. He died in Alexandria, Egypt. He was drugged by horses through the streets until he was dead because he risked it all for the gospel. Luke was hanged in Greece because of his preaching to the lost. John who wrote the book we just finished, the book of John and the Revelation, he was cast into a pot of boiling oil. The Bible says that the Lord rescued him out of that and he was saved. So then he was just exiled to the island of Patmos. And, but that's where the Lord gave him the book of the Revelation that we have in our Bible now. Life of ease and comfort, right? Sounds like it. Peter, he was crucified upside down on an X-shaped cross because he told his tormentors he didn't feel worthy to die in the same way that Jesus died. So he should die on an X instead of a cross upside down so he wouldn't be crucified the same way as his Lord. James, he was beheaded. James and John, remember like the brothers? 
And James, he was a fisherman by trade and, and uh, he was headed, beheaded. Uh, James the Just, he was a great leader of the church. They took him up to the temple. You remember where Satan tempted Jesus? He said, throw yourself down. Uh, doesn't the Bible say that the angels will protect you and won't let your foot be harmed by a stone? They took him up to the top of that pinnacle of the temple that, on that wall and they said, deny Jesus or we're pushing you off. And they said, no, I can never deny my faith in Jesus. And they pushed him off. He fell a hundred feet and he hit the ground, but he didn't die. And so they came and they beat him to death with clubs because he still wouldn't renounce his faith. Bartholomew, he was a witness to modern day Turkey. He was crucified for his faith. Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross after being whipped in agony. They whipped him and filleted him with the whip. Thomas, you know the doubter? He got all his doubts settled. And he decided he was going to be a missionary to India. He went as far as India establishing the church. He risked everything and they stabbed him with a spear during one of his missionary trips. Jude, the brother of Jesus, he was killed with arrows for refusing to deny his faith. Matthias, the one who replaced, uh, who replaced uh, Judas, he was beheaded. Barnabas, he was, uh, he was stoned to death for preaching. Philip was crucified. Paul, you know the story for him, he was beheaded. Andrew, the brother of Peter, it says that they crucified him on a cross and they bound him up with ropes so that he wouldn't have to push himself up so he wouldn't suffocate as quickly. They wanted him to suffer for a longer time. And the Bible says that for two days, not the Bible, but history says that he preached for two whole days to his captors and his tormentors about the truth of the gospel. The Bible says when James, not the Bible, sorry, when history, history says when James was beheaded, um, that he was walking along and the Roman guard that accompanied him, he was sharing his faith with the Roman guard and it got time for him to be beheaded and he wouldn't deny his faith and the Roman guard knelt down beside him and he was beheaded as well because he wouldn't deny the faith. As I read over these stories, like I don't really see this promise of safety and ease. You know what? They were willing to risk everything. And do you know, do you know why? Look right here. Here's why they risked everything. They thought that was the only normal response to what Jesus had risked for them. They looked at all that Jesus did for them. He said, you've sacrificed yourself on my behalf. You took my hell that I was supposed to pay for forever and ever and ever. And you paid for my sins. And you died for me. And you came back from the dead. And you sent your Holy Spirit. And he opened my eyes. And I saw what you did. And I surrendered to you in faith. And you came and you lived inside of me. And you changed my life. And you changed my destiny. And you gave me a home in heaven forever and ever and ever and ever with you. Why should I not risk it all? That's the only normal response. That's what they thought. I mean, they were willing to give up houses and lands and positions and safety and titles and all of this stuff. And for us, sometimes we don't even want to give up 5%. They, do you think they were really that concerned about fully funding their 401k? I mean, there was, eternity was their retirement plan, right? I mean, listen, they risked everything so they could tell other people about Jesus. Sometimes we won't even risk an awkward conversation. We, we don't, oh, that would make people uncomfortable. It would make me uncomfortable. I do that. I don't, I, I, I talk to my neighbor, but I, I'll invite him to church, but I don't want to tell him about Jesus right now and about salvation. And that would be awkward, right? And they were willing to die for their faith, right? Think about what they did. Listen, um, I, I want to just ask you, I want to have a gut check time because the Lord really spoke to me about this. We're, he's going to ask us to do some very risky things through this series. Are you ready for that? He had asked me if I was ready. Like, what, do you love your money so much or is Jesus Lord over your money? Right? Like I was thinking, I love my motorcycle. I, we got our tax refund back, right? And, and I'm getting ready to go get my motorcycle fixed. I need a new rear tire and I got to get it inspected and, you know, just a tune up, stuff like that. And I've been waiting. I'm like, yeah, I'm pumped. I can ride it spring. It's not cold. This is going to be fantastic. And, I, and I'm thinking, I'm talking to the Lord about this. I know risky generosity is coming up. And the Holy Spirit just prompts me and says, I'm not telling you to do this, but what if I did? What if I told you to go and sell that? And then take that money and give it so that kids in India can have clean water. Or so that uh, people can hear about me in Ethiopia with the Post family. Or what? Would you do that? Like, w w would you, what if I told you to take your bank account and just slash it down? To nothing. It just said, what, only thing that's left is just what's to pay your bills. And 
would you do that for me? I really had to think about that. And Jesus said, well, are you willing to risk it all? Or are you just, are you just like the rich young ruler, right? Who goes away sad because you love your stuff more than you love me. Like, well, would, would you be willing to give up food for a few days? He's going to ask us to fast. Well, um, you love food, David. Would you be willing... You guys know I love food. Would, would you be willing to give up food so that I could have intimate time in prayer with you? Would, would you exchange that so that when you fast, I could talk to you? Would, would you be willing to give up and risk some awkward conversations with a neighbor or a coworker so you can tell them about me? Would, would you be willing to give up... What if I said have a, a party at your home for homeless people that you can gather to come? Would you do that? What would you risk for me? What if I told you to sell everything you've got and go to a country that's hostile towards Christians that jail them so that you could tell people about me? Would you do it, David? Listen, the answer to those questions really says whether we're willing to take the risks. Like Jesus said, if you're willing to really say you're a follower of me, deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Or whether we're just still trying to be Lord and make our life comfortable and easy, right? Listen, Jesus is calling us to be risk takers. You know why? Look right here. He's so worth it. He's so worth it. Every one of these guys that gave their life, do you know what they said? They echoed the words that Paul said. He says, if I live longer, for me to live, that's for Jesus. That's awesome. But if I die, that's gain. That's everything. What do I got to lose? It, 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 I'm willing to risk everything. I'm willing to risk time. I'm willing to risk relationships. I'm willing to risk comfort and ease and all of this stuff and money and whatever it is because I know that even if loss comes to me, I have real security instead of this myth of safety and comfort and ease. I will have peace no matter what happens because even if I lose, I'll count everything that I lost as trash. Trash compared to the joy of knowing Jesus. Listen, he's calling us to be risky because safety is overrated. Let's pray. This morning, my ask to you is just if you're willing to take that commitment, whatever he tells you to do, like, I'm not saying he's going to tell you to sell your vacation home. I'm not telling he's, he's going to tell you to sell your car. What, I'm not saying that he's going to tell you to do that. I don't know what he's going to tell you to do. I'm not saying that he's going to tell you to make your friendship awkward and bring up Jesus in this relationship. I don't know what he's going to ask you to do. But I'm just asking you, are you willing to take whatever risk he tells you? Or are you wanting to be comfort, comfortable, have this life of ease? Because the Bible says that's not a real gospel. If you really want to follow after me, you've got to deny yourself. Take up your cross. Be willing to suffer. Follow me. Whatever the risk. Because at that place, that's the real place of security. That's literally the, the, most, the least risky place to be. Because even when you risk it all, if you're risking it for Jesus, it'll never go empty. But if you try to stay over here and buy the lie and the myth that you can control your life and you can make it safe and you can make it comfortable and you can make it easy and oh, he's going to be Lord. And I want to tell you, he says, I'm not really Lord over that person. There's some of you in the house today and the Holy Spirit's opened your eyes to really understand what Jesus did for you when he was on the cross. Today, He's saying, if you want to follow me, I've done everything for you to do it. It's not about you earning salvation. It's not about you living a good life. It's all about you just saying, I'll be Lord over your life. You're going to surrender your life to me. And you'll do whatever I lead you to do. The Bible says... If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart God raised Him from the dead, you're saved. You're a new person. So right now, I believe there's somebody in this place that you need to do that. You know about Jesus, but you don't know Jesus. So right now, 
Would you just confess with your mouth that he's going to be Lord over your life? He's going to be the one in control, not you anymore from this moment on. Would you just pray that? Just say, dear Jesus, from this moment on, you're going to be Lord. You're going to control my life. And I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. The Bible says that at that moment, the Holy Spirit has opened your eyes. He's come to live inside. He's changed your destiny from a destiny of death to a destiny of life. He's making you into a new person. Your old stuff, your old sin, your old nature, all that is gone. It's buried away and He's making you new. And so right now, I just want to celebrate that with you. If you did that today, I just want you to fill out one of those little response cards. Make sure your name and address is on it. Put a little check mark in the top box that says, I prayed to receive Christ. And I just, I want to send you a book about what you do now. That you've started this relationship where Jesus is Lord. So make sure you leave that card right there in your seat. I'll get it. I'll mail it to you this week, okay? But there are many others of us in this house. And today you know Jesus. You call Him Lord. But your life is about making yourself comfortable and safe and easy. And today Jesus is saying you need to risk whatever I tell you to risk. Whether it's small or it's huge. Will you risk it? Because he's worthy of the risk. He says the church that denies themselves in this way and they take up their cross and they follow me. The gates of hell will not be able to stand against that kind of church. That's where revival is going to happen. That's where people are going to come to know Jesus. That's where the world is turned upside down. But not if you don't risk. Not if you just care about being comfortable and safe. So right now for everybody else in this house, if you feel convicted like the Holy Spirit convicted me this week. And I want us to do something different. This first week is, is uh, the corporate risk that I'm asking you to take is very low. But it's to prepare your heart for the bigger risks later. I'm going to ask you every single day to start out your day with a prayer. And it's a specific prayer. It's one that I've modeled after these verses. I, I have a friend of mine that I've started to get to know. His name is Father Robert. He's the, the priest over at the Greek Orthodox Church and here in town. And we have differing theologies about different things, but he loves Jesus. And he was telling me about their liturgy, their worship service. Their worship service has been the same for a thousand years. They literally, he said, you could transport me back a thousand years ago and it would be the exact same. He was telling me about some of the elements of some of the stuff that they do. And there's such beauty and rich tradition in some of the stuff that they do. And, and as I was thinking about today and the risk that we should take, I, I want us to pray a prayer, a particular prayer. And I, I know for, for me, I don't read prayers to the Lord very often. This is different for you too. But there is beauty in this liturgy. And so I'm going to email out to every person. Just make sure your email address is on the response card. I'm going to email you tomorrow morning. But every day between now and next Sunday, I want you to wake up. And before your feet hit the floor, I want you to pray this prayer of surrender to the Lord Jesus. If you know Jesus, I want you to pray it every single day as a corporate body. Every day when we wake up. This is your first little risk to prepare you for big risks. But if you feel like me and you feel like, man, you know what? Your life has been about being comfortable and you, you haven't been willing to risk before, but you're willing to risk now. So that you can have true security instead of this myth of safety. Then I just want you to pray this prayer after me for the first time. Alright? I just want you to pray it out loud. As a commitment to the Lord that together as the body of Christ, we're going to risk and be a risky church. So that the gates of hell will not be able to contain and prevail against us. So that people will come to know Jesus and they'll be discipled in community as part of the family of God. So they can find out their gifts and be the church instead of just coming to church. So if you're ready, the Lord's convicted you like he convicted me, then just pray this right after me. I'm just going to say it a few words at a time. And I want you to pray it out loud right after me with all of your heart. Just say, today... I want to follow after your example, Jesus. 
You're my Savior. You're Lord over my life. You've rescued me and changed me. Today I'm denying myself. Denying my fears. Denying my ungodly desires. Denying my selfishness. Denying my tendency to make life about me. Today I die to my agenda. To my schedule. And I count my day as dead to me. And surrendered and alive to you. I know you have a plan and you want me to be a part. I'll keep my eyes open. I'm not looking for the myth of safety. But I'll risk whatever you call me to risk. So I can have true security. And if the risk costs me, I'll count it as loss for the joy of knowing you. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. If that's your prayer today, I just want you to uh, stand and we're going to sing. And uh, I want us to be ready. God's going to call us to risk some things over the next several weeks as a church. And I want us to be ready to do that. It's going to be an amazing ride that He takes us on. I can't wait to see what He does. And so just stand and make this song your continued prayer that you just prayed.